Welcome again to our DCF Disabled Christian Fellowship Programme. Now, this is the March edition, and we hope you'll enjoy the programme from beginning to end. If you're in a home, we hope that you'll not fall asleep amongst all the others who are sitting around you, that you'll keep alert until the end of the programme, for we have some wonderful uh, items this this month around. Now, the first one, you've been uh, sending in your favourite uh, choruses, and this is a favourite for many of you. It's sometimes called Scotch Broth, or we'll call it today Irish Stew, because there's a number of choruses all put together. The old, old story, it is ever new. Let's go for that one first of all. The old, old story It is ever new The old, old story Praise the Lord, it's true That Jesus died for me As well as you I love the old, old story When the road Called up yonder, I'll be walking in the King's Highway. Tell me the old, old story. I love it better every day. Hallelujah! I will make you fishers of men if you only follow me. Now, none but Christ can satisfy, and there's no other name. Keep up with us. I think we'll have it another time. The old, old story, it is ever new. The old, old story, praise the Lord, it's true that Jesus died for me as well as you. I love the old, old story. When the road is called up yonder, I'll be walking in the King's Highway. What else have we got for today? Well, we've got another chorus which we haven't had on our uh, DCF programs. I've plenty up there. Mm -hmm. You know, people are concerned about having enough money and enough possessions to get them through this life. But that's not the most important thing. It's good to have treasure in heaven. I've plenty up there. I'm a real millionaire. I'm going to be poor no more. How can you be a millionaire in grace. Well, listen to these words. I've plenty up there, I'm a real millionaire, I'm going to be poor no more. I've riches untold, something better than gold, in Jesus I keep my store. That's how you can be a millionaire in grace. Do you have that in your heart? 
all those wonderful blessings today? Well, I trust you have. And so to help you today, if you haven't got that, then here is another little chorus. Yvonne, what is the chorus we're going to sing just now? Lay up treasure in heaven. Life will pass away. Yes. Treasure in heaven, life will pass away. Lay up treasure in abundant measure for the great accounting day. Lay up treasure in heaven, no man can be poor. Thou shalt reign with the sons of. Treasure in heaven, though men come be poor, thou shalt reign with the sons of God forevermore. We're going to pray just now before we continue with our program. And then Yvonne will introduce the next part of our program. Please join me as we lift our hearts to the Lord in prayer. How we thank you today that your word tells us that Jesus is the pearl of great price. Mm -hmm. And we thank you today that those who know you, Lord, are rich. They have got a treasure that this world cannot give. And thank God today they have a treasure of grace that this world cannot take away. And we know this day that you came into our world to bring this wonderful, glorious gift, the gift of salvation through the precious name and the precious blood of Jesus. And what a treasure that is. And so today as we've been singing about treasure and about wealth, help us to remember that the things of earth are only for a season. Our wealth in the bank, our treasures on earth, will waste away. And the Bible says the moth and the rust will eat them up. And But we thank you today that we're going to a place where no moth and no rust can eat up the treasure that we have in Jesus if we are truly saved. Mm -hmm. And, O oh Lord, I pray today, bless our program and those who share in it. Thank you for this day, and thank you for all our friends and all our DCF people and anyone today who will follow our message on YouTube, on DVD, or indeed on CD. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to take a little rest and introduce you to an amazing family in America that we have come to know just through writing to them on Facebook. But it's Michael Eldridge who sometimes sings for us in the programme and he sings four different parts. That's clever, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But he's joining his family today or his family are joining him and they're singing, I think it must be the favourite hymn of our Korean DCF. What a friend we have in Jesus. Sing along if you know it. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer oh, we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear Oh, because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations? Is there 
friend so faithful, who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come with the Lord of care. Precious Savior, still our rest. Despise for safety. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Now, after that, uh, song from the Eldridge family. We're going to have a little granddaughter of ours that you're coming to know. Her name is Zara. She's our second youngest granddaughter and she lives in Scotland with her parents and her brother and sister. Now sometimes Zara, when she's here with us uh, from Scotland, likes to go on the programme of Glad Tidings Hour, which we do weekly, and uh, she would do a story for us occasionally. So I like you to hear it as well. And so Zara is going to tell us the story of Mary Slessor. Mary Slessor was born in Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland on the 2nd of December 1848. Her father was a shoemaker, but his earnings were usually spent in the taverns or pubs. Household items had to be sold to provide the family's necessary food and clothing. Mary was the second of seven children. She accepted Jesus as her saviour when she was young and found her comfort, joy and strength in reading the Bible. Missionary stories, especially from Africa, captured her interest too. The children attended Sunday school faithfully and were always excited when a missionary was speaking in the church. At 11 years of age, Mary began to work in the spinning and weaving mills. She started at 6 o'clock in the morning and worked until 6 o'clock in the evening. It was hard work. How she wished that her daddy hadn't lost his job because of drink. After working at a dangerous loom all day, she often went to bed hungry. It's Sunday and the sun is shining, Mary's little sister said, shaking her awake. Mary loved Sundays and the sunshine, but she didn't want to miss a minute of it. All the family, except her dad, walked to the church. Her house was dark and dingy, but the church was bright and clean, and they loved hearing the stories about Jesus. Mary's mum loved Jesus with all her heart, and her children wanted to be like her. She loved stories about Africa, and often, as she worked in the mill, she thought about Africa and all the little children who had never heard of Jesus. I'd love to go and tell them Bible stories, she dreamed, but she hadn't been to school since she was 11. It's only a dream, she thought. Then, in 1873, the news came from Africa that the famous missionary David Livingston had died. Mary was about 25 years old. She asked her mother if she could go to Africa as a missionary. In 1875, she sent her application to the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland, offering herself as a missionary in Calabar, a city in Nigeria, West Africa. She was accepted on the condition that she take some studies at a school in Edinburgh. On the 5th of August, 1876, she boarded the ship for Africa. After five weeks sailing from Liverpool, they entered the harbour at Calabar. Look at the children, she squealed. Look at their bright eyes. Look at their shiny white teeth. 
Look at their curly black hair! Her first duty was to study and learn the trade language called Ethic. From her very first contact with the natives, her heart was deeply touched because of the cruel treatment they received from their chief. They were whipped, sold and killed. Mary was keen to learn the difficult language. After all, the main reason for her coming to Africa was to lead people to Jesus. The boys and girls had to be taught to read and write. She knew that she had to live the Christian life as well as preach about God and salvation before the natives would accept her, her teaching and her saviour. One day she was told that a woman had died after giving birth to her baby. So the baby was taken out to the bush or forest to die too. Mary could hardly believe her ears. It had an evil spirit, the lady said. That's why the mother died. And if anyone takes the baby, they will die too. Mary found the baby, who had been left to die five days before. Picking up the tiny life, she took her home, bathed her and applied cream to the white ant bites. She started to give her some milk. The white woman with red hair will die soon, the women said to each other. But Mary Slessor did not die, and eventually the villagers decided that the baby didn't have an evil spirit after all. In those days, the mother of twins was thought to be possessed of an evil spirit, and she, together with her twins, would be killed. Mary would plead for the mothers and often take the twins to her own humble home. She was gathering quite a little family about her. The villagers began to see that babies didn't have evil spirits, and eventually the people of Calabar stopped leaving babies in the bush, and they stopped killing twins. She supervised the construction of humble schoolhouses and churches. She had the joy of pointing many people to the Lord, on her three brief trips home, she would plead with the people to pray for the work in Calabar. She would often repeat, It is not Mary Slessor, but God and our united prayers that have brought the blessings to Calabar. Christ will have all the honour and glory for what is accomplished. But Mary became critically ill with a fever in the early part of January 1915. A doctor was called, but he could do nothing to save her life. In her dying hour, on the 13th of January, 1915, surrounded by the native Christian girls and women, she went to be with the Lord. The natives cried bitterly, Our mother is dead. Everybody's mother has left us. Mary Slessor once wrote to a friend who had long prayed for her. I have always said that I have no idea how or why God has carried me over so many strange and hard places and made these people submit to me or why the government should have given me the privilege of being a magistrate among them except an answer to prayer made for me. The only way I can explain it is that I have been prayed for more than most. Pray on, dear one. God answers prayer. On another occasion, she wrote, Prayer is the greatest power God has put into our hands for service. Praying is harder than doing, at least I find it so, but it is the way to advance his kingdom. Do you know any missionaries? Do you pray for them? God answers our sincere believing prayer. Don't you appreciate the story? And I know that you appreciate Zara as well. Thank you indeed, Zara. If you're watching our program, thank you for telling us that wonderful story about Mary Slessor, the great missionary to Africa. And aren't you enjoying the programs? We're excited about these programs that go out month by month. And all those who share on our programs, we have a lovely team of people who have willingly given their time to provide messages for our programs and songs for our programs, and you are enjoying them. 
and we appreciate that so much. Thank you, thank you indeed. And to our good friend Roy Rainey, we need to mention Roy. Mildred is actually going to be singing just now. Uh, God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. Uh, but you're going to find out what God has promised. But behind every good woman, there's a great man. No, that's not the way to say it. Sure it's not. <laughs> I know you folks would uh, dispute that. But it's true today to say that Roy and Mildred make up a great team. Roy is the one who edits our program and prepares it for you to watch. So we appreciate that very much. But after we listen to this song by Mrs. Mildred Rainey, then we have a fine young man who lives in Scotland in the kingdom of Fife with his wife, Rebecca. His name is Ian Jemison. We have come to know Ian just through communication on social media, and he is servant of the Lord, ministering constantly and full-time for our Saviour Jesus. Some time back, he spent time on the staff of Buckingham Palace for a period of two years. But now he's back in Scotland and he's serving the Lord. And he is the guest speaker for our program today. I know that you will enjoy and appreciate the ministry that Ian shares with us. So without any further ado, we're going to go right through Mildred's song and then our dear friend Ian Jemison with the message for you today. God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God hath Strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing kindness, undying love. God hath not promised we shall not know. And temptation, trouble and woe. He hath not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. But God hath promised strength for the day, rest for the the trials, help from above, unfailing kindness, undying love. God hath not promised smooth roads and wide, swift easy travel, needing no guide, never Hello, and thank you so much for this opportunity to spend a short time with you in the Word of God for this DCF 
Raleigh. My name is Ian Jamieson and I live in the village of Thornton in Fife with my wife Rebecca on the east coast of Scotland and it's really a privilege to spend this time with you in God's word. I hope that you're encouraged and keeping safe and well. Let's turn to the word of God. I want to ask you two questions. The first is very personal. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I wonder what your answer to that would be. I'm sure that for many of you watching uh, this video today, you would say yes, absolutely yes. How long have you got for me to tell you what Jesus Christ means to me? There might be others, though, watching this video now or in the future who would say, well, I don't know a great deal about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to speak to you as well today. The second question is this. If you do love the Lord Jesus then why? Why do you love him? There are two places in the Bible, one in the Old Testament and one in the New, where this is stated very clearly indeed. Why it is that those who love God do indeed love him. First of all, I'll read you a well-known verse in 1 John and chapter 4. A lovely verse, very simple. It simply says this, we love him because he first loved us. Isn't that wonderful? We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. God is the one who has shown us love. God is the one who has taken the initiative in sending his son, the Lord Jesus, and winning our hearts. But it's this answer stated in the Old Testament that I would like to draw your attention to today. And I'd like to take you to the book of Psalms, please, and to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. And this wonderful psalm begins in this way. I love the Lord because. I love the Lord because. And then the whole of the rest of the psalm is really a, an elongated answer to that uh, question. I love the Lord because. And the Lord is spoken of and depicted and described in four lovely ways in this psalm. We find in the opening few verses that God is the listener. God is the listener. How important that we are listened to. And what a quality it is to be a good listener. I wonder if I'm a good listener. I wonder if you are. And then secondly, he is spoken of as the deliverer, the one who rescues. And then we read about him as the saviour, the one who saves. And then lastly, as the master. The Lord Jesus is the master of every Christian. He is our master. He is our Lord. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is true eternally. That is true universally. But individually, personally, he's also Lord of our lives for every born again Christian. Well, I would like to uh, look with you at four particular instances in this lovely psalm where uh, an expression is used. And that is where the psalmist says that he's going to call on the name of the Lord. He's going to call on the name of the Lord. Four times we read that in this lovely psalm. Let me draw your attention to them. We could group them in, in, in two sets of two. The first is reasons to call upon the name of the Lord. Two reasons to call upon the name of the Lord. And the second is two responses. Two descriptions of how we respond to him in calling upon his name. The first is found in the opening verses. And let's read those together. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Here's the listener. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. It is because he hath inclined his ear. He's heard my supplications. Well, the first one I want to draw your attention to is this. We call upon the one who answers our supplications. Who answers our supplications. He is a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God, isn't he? And I'm sure that many of you watching this video today would be able to testify of answered prayer in your life. Isn't it wonderful when we're reflecting perhaps on past events, things that have happened, and we can see so clearly the providential hand of God at work. We couldn't attribute it to anyone else or to anything else. It is God invading our ordinary lives and answering our prayers. Isn't it wonderful? 
Isn't it wonderful that just the simple prayers that you and I can pray in our homes, by our bedsides, are heard in the throne room of the God of the universe? I want to just uh, read to you a verse or two from the book of Revelation. What a wonderful book that is that gives us such a, a fascinating vision of the future that is before us. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, we read this. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of the saints. These are vials full of odours or vapours that represent the prayers of the saints. What a wonderful picture of our prayers ascending into the throne room of heaven. And how can that be possible? It is because we have a great high priest before the throne of God. You and I don't have need of a a human priesthood to, to intercede between us and God. We have direct access through the torn curtain, the new and living way that has been made for us in Christ. And there he is, our great high priest. And he makes it possible that that the faltering, stumbling prayers of somebody like me, Somebody like you can actually be heard and not only heard, friends, but answered by the God of heaven. So I call upon the Lord, says the psalmist, because he answers my prayers. He is the listener. But then we read on in verses three and four and we find this second use of the phrase calling on the name of the Lord. The sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Deliver my soul. He is not only the listener, he is the deliverer. He is the one who rescues. He delivers our souls. Now, of course, this psalm is in the Old Testament part of the scriptures, but it points forward, doesn't it, as the whole Old Testament does, to a hill outside the city walls of Jerusalem that we call Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull, where our wonderful saviour, would die upon the cross. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ die upon the cross? He died there to pay the penalty for sin that you and I deserve to pay, to purchase for us freedom, redemption, deliverance from sin. The psalmist here is opening his heart, sharing his personal testimony, the sorrows of death compass me, he says, I wonder if you and I know what it's like to pass through those valley experiences where everything around us seems dark, And yet we can trust in the God of deliverance. We know that he delivered us from from sin, from death, from the certainty of hell. And he did that through the shed blood of his precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And so therefore we can have absolute confidence that in those dark uh, valley experiences of life, that same God of deliverance will come to our aid. So two reasons to call upon the name of the Lord. We call upon him because he answers our supplications, and we come up and we call upon him because he delivers our souls. If you're a born-again Christian watching this, then your soul has been delivered. If you're not, if you're not a Christian, then let me just say at this moment that your soul can be delivered. We'll come back to that uh, just towards the end. And then we have the two responses. The two responses as the psalmist calls upon the name of the Lord. We'll read verses 12 and 13. And here we find a second question posed in the psalm. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Isn't it good, friends, every now and again, regularly in fact, to take stock of the blessings that God has poured out richly upon our lives? Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. When we think about answers to prayer... When we think about doors that have opened for us, when we think about healing that has come or restoration or reconciliation with broken friendships or all sorts of wonderful answered prayers and blessings that the Lord pours out upon our lives. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? And then he gives the answer. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I'll take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Prophetically speaking, this points us forward to the cup of blessing that we bless. I'm sure that in the churches that you belong to, um, perhaps at different times and perhaps in different ways, the Lord's Supper is commemorated and that cup is taken 
and we partake from that cup, don't we, to remember the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Earlier in the Psalms, I just want to read to you a verse from Psalm 75. Psalm 75, and this psalm, uh, rather than a psalm of thanksgiving, such as the psalm we're looking at, it's a psalm about judgment, a psalm about future judgment. And there's a very solemn verse that's found here in verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Very solemn. We're reading here about the cup of the wrath of God. And friends, that's the cup that you and I, naturally speaking, deserve to drink because of our sin and our wrongdoing. The things that you and I have done and said and thought that fall short of God's standard of holiness. And yet this cup, this cup was drank in full by the Lord Jesus Christ. The spotless, perfect, sinless Son of God drank that cup of God's wrath down to its very dregs on the cross of Calvary. So much so that he was able to cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And now there's only blessings draft for us. There's now only the cup of blessing uh, in place of the cup of God's wrath. So he answers my supplications. He delivers my soul and I will lift up the cup of salvation. He is the deliverer. He's the saviour. And I'll lift up that cup of salvation. And then lastly, verse 17 I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. How wonderful to be able to sacrifice to God, to be able to offer something back to him for all that he has done for us, for all his benefits towards me, as we read in verse 12. This makes me think of a verse in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. And we read here, By him, therefore, Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. How good to give thanks to our God. He is so worthy of our thanksgiving. So we find these four instances of calling upon the name of the Lord in this psalm. We call upon him because he answers our supplications. He's a prayer hearing and answering God, the most wonderful listener. He never turns us away. He always has time to listen to us. He delivers our souls and it cost him everything. It cost him his one and only begotten son. And we lift up that cup of salvation, remembering that the cup of wrath was drunk by our saviour and now the cup of blessing, the cup of salvation belongs to us. And then we find also that we can offer a sacrifice. We can praise him with our lips and with our lives. But I wonder how you did answer that opening question, friends. I wonder how you answered that opening question of, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope that you answered, yes, I do. But perhaps there might be people watching this who would say, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I really have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure if I'm really born again. You know, the answer uh, comes from the very phrase we've been looking at today, calling upon the name of the Lord. Let me take you to the book of Romans, the book of Romans in a very well-known section, Romans chapter 10. And here we find some wonderful promises. You know, before I I went into Christian work, uh, I studied law. And in uh, law, you look at contracts, don't you? And um, some contracts have loopholes in them. But the contracts and promises in the word of God are cast iron, cast iron guarantees that we can trust and depend upon. We read this in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Not might be, not possibly, not perhaps, but thou shalt be saved. A cast iron promise. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then later in verse 13, just to drive this home, the apostle says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord and asked him to save you, then do so today without delay. 
Thank you so much for listening and for allowing me to spend this time with you in the Word of God. Every blessing. We pray that God will bless that message to your hearts today. And indeed today, if you don't know Jesus, that this will be the time when you will put your hand into his wonderful, loving, nail-pierced hands and that you will trust him as your personal Savior. And for all those today who know the Savior, who can say, yes, you know, I am saved and I know it. Well, may God bless you and keep you bright and ready and watching for the Lord's return. Now we're going to conclude our program with a lovely song by a man who was a very dear friend of ours, stayed in our home and we in their home and uh, in communication with them over the years. And the man's name is the Reverend Douglas Crossman. He's singing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Now Douglas grew up in Wales, South Wales. So he's got a nice Welsh voice. Mm -hmm. And here he is singing. And then I will close the program in prayer after our friend Douglas Crossman sings to us this beautiful hymn. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine for thee. All the pleasures of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on the Calvary stream. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my I will love thee in life, I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and say when the Death dew lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now in mansion. Of glory and endless delight, I ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I loved thee, my
my Jesus, tis now. Now, thank you for watching, and let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you today for everything that you have been saying to us through our dear friends who have shared on our program. And what a varied program it has been. We pray that it will touch many hearts and lives. And God bless it wherever it goes, anywhere and everywhere in this world. And especially we pray for our Disabled Christian Fellowship groups and people today here in Ireland, that your blessing will rest upon them and that you will be with us all now until we meet again on another program in your will and time. Amen. Amen. Amen.